the ranger who'd been talking on his walkie-talkie stopped us, and he said, uh, hold on a minute, guys. I'm going to need you to just stay here on this platform for a few minutes because there's some bear activity in the area. So we waited, and then all of a sudden, through the trees came the biggest bear I have ever seen. This is the Dear Bob and Sue podcast, our stories of adventures and misadventures as we traveled to all the U.S. national parks and other public lands. I'm Karen Smith. And I'm Matt Smith. We're the authors of the Dear Bob and Sue series of books. Today we're going to go bear watching in Katmai National Park. We are. Katmai is a very unique park and preserve in southwestern Alaska that's a habitat for salmon and home to several thousand brown bears. Now, if you stay in the park during peak bear season, you'll have plenty of close encounters with these animals. We certainly did. And you'll hear about all of them in today's episode. (laughs) And to kick things off, we're talking about hiking with bear spray whenever we're in bear country and asking what exactly happens when a can of bear spray expires. And at the end of the episode, we'll answer a question from a listener in our mailbag segment. Well, you'll be happy to know that I was cleaning out the garage today or my workshop and organizing the camping stuff, and I found the expired bear spray, and I've taken it out of the rotation, so we don't take it with us anymore. Oh, that's good, because it seemed to me there were a few hikes that we did where I was the one carrying the expired bear spray. There were, (laughs) however, when you were carrying the expired bear spray, it, it was expired by like Two months. So how do you know when it goes bad? How expired can it be and still work? Well, I don't know. There's there's a date on it. So you, uh-huh. there is a date. And it's not like, you know, if it's one day past the expired date, it's, it's no good. But I guess that like the contents of it, the ingredients that doesn't really change. It's like pepper spray. Mm-hmm. It's like massive pepper spray. It's I think it's the accelerant. That doesn't work. It's like a really old can of spray paint. The paint's still in it, but like it might be clogged or just the I accelerant see. doesn't work. So so there's no force to it anymore, probably. You don't want – it's like when you have a beehive and you're going to spray it with like some whatever raid – and you get ready to spray it and like you push the button and like one drop comes out and hits the beehive and all you've done is made a thousand bees angry. You don't yeah. want that to happen with the bear. No, you, you, you don't. don't want like one drop of bear spray coming out and it just makes the bear matter. Right. And I know bear spray usually costs about uh, around $40 a can, but I feel like it's a really good investment to always have a um, not expired can of bear spray on your person. Well, it, yeah, it's not inexpensive. So I want to like keep it for 20 years, but that's that's not a good idea. Right. What, whatever the ex- ex- expiration date is, you have to pay attention to that. But I'm, I'm looking forward to testing the expired bear spray, though. You, you, but, you can't just throw it away. Oh, sure. So you so what do you do? You're, you're actually going to try to shoot it? Yeah, I'm going to go way out in the backyard and <laughs> where, make sure it's not a windy day, and I'm going to shoot it. <laughs> I want to watch it. that. Let me know when you do that. I want to see. I mean, really, everybody should kind of practice bear spray. Like, I, I'm curious to know, like, what it – how it comes out, how far it goes. Like, Yeah, I – I, I'm going to wait for the moles to come out. <laughs> I would have to do something to You're not encourage... going to shoot it at the moles. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm going to shoot it at the moles if I can. I rarely see them. Yeah. They usually don't come out. Well, maybe just the red pepper residue on the grass will be enough of a deterrent. They, they're, they're probably not going to like that. They They probably won't like that. Yeah. Although they're wily, so... They'll probably figure out a way to, yeah, like work around the bear spray. <laughs> but no, I'm gonna sp- I'm gonna spray the bear spray in the backyard. And, okay. Because I I don't think that the first time you ever spray 
a bear spray canister should be when the bear is coming at you. Exactly. That's like, what I'm saying. I there think we should, should be have some, some training. Practice. Yes. And I want you to know, so usually when we hike in bear country, no, always when we hike in bear country, you're the you're in the lead. So that if if we turn a corner and there's a bear on the trail and we surprise that bear, he's going to go for you first, obviously. So the responsibility is on me to save your life. And I do not take that lightly. So I, you know, I, I looked back at some pictures and in Grand Teton National Park, you, you took a photo of me hiking on the trail and I actually have the bear spray in my hand. Right. They, I, I think sometimes people feel like if they're in a group of three or four and somebody has bear spray. That's okay. I personally, I would, I, th when you're in bear country, I think everyone should have their own canister and it should be very, very close by there. There have been instances where people have been attacked from behind by bear and, there's there's no chance of looking for the bear spray or like right. like fiddling around in a pocket or trying to reach for the in your water pocket on the side of your backpack and I I know that's an extreme situation but it would only have to happen once and it would be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That brings up a good point. I think we should both get I saw that you can buy bear spray holsters with that have a belt loop and you just basically run your belt through it and it's on your hip or, you know, the front of your waist or whatever, I feel like we should get those because I'd, I'd know when it's in my outside water pocket, there's no way I would have time to react and get that thing out and save your life. So I think we should invest in some uh, some holsters for ourselves. Some holsters. Mm -hmm. you, want, you want a holster. <laughs> Is that could, not could, what it's called? Well, could it, have, <laughs> could it have other pockets for like my flashlight and I don't other know, things? but, you know, that might be a good idea of something you could make. The holster. Uh, okay, I had the idea of the naked uh, holster no, 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 no. <laughs> for, for for going into bathrooms with yeah, pedestal sinks where you can carry all your stuff in a holster. But yeah, we're not revisiting that. Okay. I'm talking about a, a bear spray holster this uh -huh. time, not a naked holster. <laughs> all right. But um, you know, the parks that always worry me the most are Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and Glacier National Park. Those are the ones where I'm always on edge as we're hiking because I feel like there could be a grizzly just waiting around the corner. Strangely enough, though, the parks that we flew to Alaska, we didn't have bear spray. We didn't because you can't take it on a plane. Right. Except for the Chilkoot Trail, that 33-mile. Right. We had some um, friends up there who loaned us their bear spray. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Right. And that's the only – so out of, what, nine places that we've visited in Alaska, nine parks – that was the only one we had bear spray. Yeah, we actually did the opposite of having bear spray when we were in Wrangell St. Elias. We were carrying smoked salmon with us. <laughs> That's right. Which is not That was dumb. That was dumb. <laughs> don't don't carry smoked salmon <laughs> in, in your back bear, bear country. <laughs> that was really dumb. We've learned a lot, but um and then in Lake Clark National Park in Alaska, our guide actually had a gun, a huge gun, yeah, instead I mean, of bear spray. Yeah, a 45 Magnum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. Real bullets the size of salt and pepper shakers. Right. Yeah. As did the volunteer ranger who was up there at Dick Prennicke's cabin. He had a gun as well. So they they look at things a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah. Well, gun or bear spray, I think, honestly, I think bear spray is more effective. Oh, definitely. I think it is too. Yeah. I think I think it's saved – not only has it saved a lot of human lives, but obviously it's saved countless numbers of bears' lives, right? The, the bear spray, after an hour or so, they're perfectly fine. So I think it's – it seems to be the right thing to carry for us as opposed to a gun. When people find out that we went to all the national parks, the first question they always ask us is – what was our favorite park? Right. <laughs> and usually we hem and haw. And <laughs> Give a different answer every time. That's right. Try to justify what we're about to say. But what Matt and I absolutely can agree on is what our favorite park experience was. And that happened to be our trip to Katmai National Park in Alaska. And a lot of times we talk to people about Katmai or we mention it. They have no idea what we're talking about. It's up in Alaska. And it was made a national monument in 1918. And the reason for that, in uh, six years earlier, in 1912, 
it was the site of a massive volcanic eruption, the Nova Rupta volcano blew in 1912. And it was, it was a massive uh, explosion. It was over 10 times the power of Mount St. Helens. So wow. it created this uh, interesting landscape that the Congress thought was really not useful for anything else. Uh, and so they made it a national monument. Uh, and it's the, the, the name of the area is the Valley of the 10,000 Smokes. In 1980, they enlarged the area of the park and also made it a national park. So it's uh, Katmai National Park and Preserve. Yes, and even though the monument was first established because of the eruption, now most of the visitors who flock to the area called Brooks Camp come for a different reason. They come to see the brown bears who congregate there in the summer. Yeah, and summer's a, a great time to go visit the park. It's open all year round, uh, but that Brooks Camp area where uh, people fish and people uh, bear watch, that area is only open from uh, June 1st to mid-September. July and September are the best times to see the bears because those are when the salmon runs are. Early July is, uh, I think, the biggest salmon run, and then there's a secondary salmon run in September, although fishing, I think, starts in early June, and so you can still fish in June. The, the, the park website says June's not a, a great time to see the bears. I think they, they start coming out late June, but uh, early July is really ideal bear watching time. Mm-hmm. And that's when we went. I believe it was July 6th, I think. Is when right. We were and there. I think August mm-hmm. is also mm-hmm. kind of a, a lower time to see the bears, like fewer bears out in mm-hmm. August. Mm-hmm. So the area that we mentioned, Brooks Camp, is where the lodging is. Now, this is a fairly small place in terms of how many people it can accommodate overnight. The lodge itself only has 16 rooms that are um, basically cabins. And then there's a campground, but it only sleeps 60 people. So it's tough to get um, it's tough to get reservations for either one. And currently now, there's a lottery in place to get reservations at the lodge. But, you know, if you can't get a reservation for overnight, you can also charge a day trip to fly in. And that's how most people see the park. They fly in for the day from other lodges. So Katmai is, like we said, it's up in Alaska. It's 280 miles southwest of Anchorage. And there are no roads that lead into the park. There's a, there's a couple of uh, service roads inside the park, mm-hmm. uh, but, the, but you can't drive into the park. The way we got there, we were on a trip that included – we flew into Anchorage. Uh, we went up to Denali and uh, spent some time in the backcountry there. Mm-hmm. We also then went to Katmai and also Lake Clark National Park that, that's not too far from, from Katmai. So that was the itinerary uh, that we had when we went. Uh, in, in order to get there, we flew a prop plane. It was a fairly good-sized prop yeah. plane from yeah. Anchorage to a little town called King Salmon. And King Salmon is just uh, west of Katmai National Park. And then from uh, King Salmon, we took a small float plane. And that trip was maybe 20, 30 minutes at the most. It was pretty mm-hmm. close. And uh, the, the float plane landed on Knack Lake. And then it just beaches right on the shore of the lake, right, right in front of the visitor center. Mm -hmm. I remember the whole time as you and I were imagining what this would be like, we wondered, you know, do you think we're going to see any bears on this trip? And as we're flying in on the float plane and it starts to come in for a landing, I remember looking out the window and I could see I could see a lot of bears at the mouth of the lake. And then, of course, there were some bears on the beach where we landed. Right. The the uh, pilot had to wait, I think, about 100 yards off. Sure, because he said there's a there's a bear standing right where I need to park the plane, and so we had to wait for the bear to mm-hmm. walk away. So our our initial experience was pretty amazing; like we were seeing bears right away, immediately. So the first thing that the park service has you do when you step off of your plane is they funnel you into the visitor center, which is is pretty close to that beach, and they have you attend their bear orientation, which I called bear school. Yeah, you you go in the little room off to the side, and 
they give you the orientation. I thought it's it's interesting when, as they're giving you the orientation, the you know they're telling you things what you should and shouldn't do in the parks, especially when you uh, come across a bear, and to make it all seem real, <laughs> you're you can look out a window. <laughs> of the visitor center and you can see the little picnic area. And I think people were eating at the picnic area. And this is, this picnic area is a little different, has a few picnic tables there. Um, it has an electric fence around it. I know. So it's <laughs> not super inviting. <laughs> it's the only place you can eat outside other than the, the campground. And you have to go inside the electric fence. Uh-huh. It looked a little like a prison it, yard. It, it did. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, yeah. It did. So as we sat through bear school, they gave us a lot of important information about what to do if we ran into a bear. So a few of the highlights that they talked about, the number one thing is is never approach a bear. They want you to stay at least 50 yards away. And if a bear approaches you, which is more often the case because you're, you're not going to approach a bear <laughs> regardless of what the rules are, uh, when they get within fifty yards, you need to make way. You need to you need to back up. Or... Oh, right, right. So along those lines, it says don't surprise them. But you know that's kind of a strange one because right, it, you don't know if you're surprising them. <laughs> if, yes, you it's, don't it's, know they're there. And it's you're as much a surprise to you right. as the bear. <laughs> yeah, and if you're actually going to try to sneak up on one and surprise it, yeah, surprise. The, <laughs> <laughs> that you, I, I don't know. You probably <laughs> you deserve what's coming. Yeah, to you, me. <laughs> you get what you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they said, if you do come upon one, you're supposed to talk calmly to it so it knows that you're a human. That's another one that's kind of like, hmm. <laughs> hmm I thought you were. I, oh, I thought I thought you were a beaver. Right. You're a human. Okay. So do they know what I humans don't, are? I don't. I think this these this is these are all things that humans made up. Uh, yeah, I think so. And then another one is don't make eye contact. I I guess like yeah. these these are hard things to do. When, well, yeah, when you, all of a sudden you come upon a bear, uh, don't make loud noises and agitate them. Well, and that is something I think is is hard for people because some people panic and scream, and, well, and yeah. that's not a that's not a good thing. That at would all. probably be me. I, I would imagine. I like the I like when they tell you to back away slowly at a diagonal. <laughs> what is a <laughs> diagonal? Like if, if there there's a bear, any direction away from the bear is there is no diagonal. Right? I know. I know. So I you have to get out of like a compass and make sure that like you're not at a right angle or. Uh, so anyway, I I don't know what a diagonal means, but I don't either. Give it a clear path to move away is mm-hmm. another one. Right, right. And then I think this one was your favorite. I remember because what because you wrote about this in the book. Get behind a tree if possible. Right. So that's <laughs> so so that w- when you're peeing yourself, no one else can <laughs> see you. I like I don't. <laughs> I, I don't know what getting behind a tree does. Like the bear can't see that the, you step behind a tree. Right. Like you're. This is not hide and go seek. Like they, they saw you. They saw you go behind the tree. Like what are you trying to do there? Right. Right. Plus they can smell you. They could, they could sniff you out. Like I I think sometimes animals like a moose. They tell you to do that with moose. I, mm-hmm. And and some of these animals that will charge you. Obviously, if you're standing behind a tree, they they can't. They're not going to charge through the tree at you. But a bear can just – I'll just reach around the tree and get you. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it seems that way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody hide. There's a bear. Right. And then the one that they stress the most, perhaps the most important rule of all, is never run from a bear. Never run from a bear. But I can tell you if a bear runs at you, you'll run. Uh, well, that story's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> they they explained it. That, um, what is it when you run from a bear? It activates their predatory mm. response, mm-hmm. and they'll it's chase ba- you. It's basically like if you throw a ball for a a dog, the dog's gonna chase it. Like they don't even know why they're chasing the ball. Mm-hmm. They they're gonna chase it, and so it's the same way. If you start running, bear's gonna chase you. 
and they say it, it's not that it might catch you. It will catch you. It will chase you. It will catch you. And then then it just gets worse from there. Yeah. So obviously these are all, you know, really good tips and important to learn. I, I just, I think for the most part, no one knows how they will react until they're in, in that situation. Right. Now there's a, a lot of times people will talk about grizzly bears and brown bears mm-hmm. and brown black bears. And so they're all, they're all different. Just to be clear, Black bears are – there's a species of bear that's a black bear, and sometimes they can be brown. They can be cinnamon. Mm-hmm. That's that's not what a brown bear is. That's a black bear that's just a brown color. And then there are grizzlies and brown bears, which are the same species, but they're different depending on where they live. Right. Right. The, the bears at Katmai, they referred to as brown bears – because they are on the coast and they eat salmon in their diet. And the ones that are inland are the grizzly bears and they mostly eat berries. Is right. that a fair and, and explanation? Right. And the, the fact that the grizzlies that are inland are mainly vegetarian, they're smaller. Mm-hmm. And the brown bears that have this access to protein like uh, salmon, uh, they generally are, are much bigger. I asked the ranger, well, how big do they get? And her answer was, we don't know that there's a limit. If As long as they can continue to eat, they will keep getting bigger. And so that was um, – that that was encouraging, <laughs> right? And there were some big bears in Katmai. There, there were. There was mm-hmm. one time we saw a bear, and I described it as a fur-covered Volkswagen. Yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty and pretty good description. <laughs> like that's not much of an exaggeration. It's not. Obviously, they're not as big as Volkswagens, but when we saw it coming through the trees. I, Volkswagen was the first thing that came to my mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And as we had mentioned earlier, um, we did not have bear spray on this trip with us because we had flown in on on many different flights, and so we were we were relying on, on our, our wits. wits. <laughs> 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 so after our bear school, we uh, checked into our cabin. Um, so these cabins are really cute. They, I think they're all pretty much the same. Ours had two sets of bunk beds and, uh, you know, a bathroom with a toilet, sink, and shower. Pretty rustic, but it was it, it's all you need there. And then what else was at the camp? We wandered around for a few minutes. There was a main lodge building that has their dining area, you know, where right, they where you can eat there. Uh, they have three meals a day, and then there's a another big room that has a circular fireplace with chairs around it, and uh, and a small bar where you can buy drinks in the afternoon and evenings. Yeah, and they had a trading post. Mm-hmm, they had a trading post and um, a ranger station, and of course down the a trail was the campground. And, um, they had a fish freezing building. Mm-hmm. So there, there are fishermen fishing for salmon in and around the bears, and uh, they can freeze their fish there. Yeah. And uh, so Brooks Camp was originally a fishing camp that was built in the 50s, and it kind of has that, um, kind of has that vibe still. And when we got out of bear school, they give us a pin. Like a graduation. <laughs> yeah, and – you're supposed to wear it somewhere on your body so that when a ranger sees you, they know that you've been through orientation mm-hmm. just in case somebody slips past the bear, right. bear school right. thing. Unfortunately, I lost my pin like almost immediately. I think maybe it wasn't fastened securely on my jacket and it fell off as we were walking somewhere. I don't know, but I, I would love to have that pin now. Yeah, I have my pin somewhere. Yeah. It's in a drawer full of beer bottle caps or something. (laughs) And we checked, yeah, so we checked in. And uh, after we checked in and got situated, we wanted to get out and see the bears as as quickly as we could. So we Mm -hmm. headed up towards Brooks Falls, Mm -hmm. which is from the main little camp areas, about 1.2 mile hike. Right, right. You actually cross over Brooks River. There's a bridge that crosses Brooks River, mm-hmm. and then at, uh, at the end of that bridge, there's a trail that goes through the trees for about another mile uh, up to Brooks Falls. But that bridge, 
they've rebuilt it since we were there. Yeah, when we were there, it was a float bridge. Remember, it was low, and now I've I've saw pictures, and it, it's a huge, really nice big bridge. And I know they have rangers stationed at each end of the bridge to hold people back if there are bears in the area. You know, Katmai does a really great job of making sure there are rangers stationed throughout the park and they all have walkie talkies. So they keep track of where the big bears are and especially the mama bears with the cubs. And they're they're keeping an eye on the on the bears and the visitors in order to keep them separated as much as they can. At the other side of that bridge is a viewing platform. Mm-hmm. Now it's not um, it's not as popular of a viewing platform because there are no falls there, and generally bears don't uh, congregate in that area. But it is a nice platform. I don't know. It's maybe eight to ten feet up off the ground, and so you can go up there. There's there's a gate. Uh, there's a couple of gates that, that you close so that you know bear, bears aren't coming up there on the platform. And you can see both Knack Knack Lake and the river, and it's 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 scenic. So that mm-hmm. we, we stopped there first. We did. Went up there. Mm-hmm. There were a few other people up there and a ranger. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, tried to f- spot some bears. <laughs> yeah, we didn't see too many. And when we were ready to leave the platform – The ranger who'd been talking on his walkie-talkie stopped us, and he said, "Uh, hold on a minute, guys. I'm going to need you to just stay here on this platform for a few minutes because there's some bear activity in the area. So we waited, and then all of a sudden, through the trees came the biggest bear I have ever seen. Yeah, I, I I think that was the Volkswagen experience we had. I think it was, too walked right where we were planning to walk. Like if we had been a few minutes earlier, we would have and not yeah, we stopped would, at the platform. We would, have, we would have surprised him. Yes, we would have surprised <laughs> then, him and us. Then gone behind a tree, <laughs> peed ourselves, and then backed away at a, at a diagonal. I know. So, you know, the bear moseyed on by, and then the ranger opened the gate and said, all right, folks, have a good time. And we, th- I, I kind of didn't want to leave the platform. Yeah, you know, the bears are like it's like uh, you know, finding a cockroach in the kitchen. Like there's not just one, right? <laughs> like okay, the razor was thought it was perfectly fine for us to go down that trail. I I was thinking, well, there's probably more, but um and there were. <laughs> there were. Yeah, so we we walked I don't know that we saw any more in that next mile. It was a little disconcerting. We were in the trees. Oh, yeah. There were no other people. and I know. Uh, I was a little on edge, to say the least. Yeah. So when we got to the area where Brooks Falls is, you, you come to this boardwalk that has a gate on it, a, a bear-proof gate. And when you're on the boardwalk, it leads to two, two separate platforms. One is called the Riffles Platform. And then the other, the, the most popular one, is the uh, Falls Platform. That's where Brooks Falls is. So Brooks Falls mm-hmm. is about a eight to ten foot fall in the middle of the river, mm-hmm. and it's just big enough that the salmon have to they have to kind of congregate at the bottom of the falls and like build up some momentum to hop up over the falls, and it takes usually takes them a, a few tries, and so that's their most vulnerable spot because they're trying to get up to Brooks Lake further upstream to spawn. And the only way to get there is up these falls. And then, of course, that's where the bears get, have their best chance of catching them. Mm-hmm. And that's where all the big bears are. So the falls platform is the most popular and That's where everyone wants to stand and take photos of the bears. And the rangers do a really good job of managing both of the platforms. They have a clipboard. And so when you get there, you put your name on the waiting list for the falls platform. They only allow about 40 people at a time on the platform, and you're allowed to stay for an hour. So there's a ranger there that's managing who goes on, how long they stay. And there is another ranger at the other platform, the Riffles, who is calling out your name when it's your turn to go. Just like a restaurant. Mm, You put your name on the list and they, they call you when your time's up. So we spent some time first at that uh, Riffles platform, which is ac- was actually really fun. 
if you had been there for the first time and that was the only platform, you would still think that's amazing. Oh, yeah. Because we saw bears. Now, the hierarchy of the fishing is there are a couple of places that are the best places for the bears to fish, the easiest way to place to catch a salmon. And radiating out from those spots is the pecking order of the bears. And so the further you get from the ideal fishing spots, the smaller the bears are, often they're juveniles. And and so down at the riffles, you could tell there were some bears that were like Mm two-year-olds who were still learning to fish. (laughs) And they would – it was hilarious. They would – they were like big dogs out there. They were. And they would see a fish and they would run after it and they would like (laughs) belly flop and – uh, then look around, like, where to go? They were putting on quite a show. Yeah. It was very amusing. And they had they, a lot of energy. They had a lot of energy. They did not quite know. We never saw any of them catch a fish. But, boy, they tried They tried their hearts out. And it, it was very entertaining to see these young bears trying to catch fish there. And the other thing you see, you'll see then mother bears kind of on the shore with their cubs right next to them. Mm-hmm. And, of course— The male bears want to kill the cubs so that the mother bears, the female bears, will go back into heat and and they can breed with them. So the mother bears cannot leave the babies like at at all. Right. So they're sitting there looking at the river and they can't go fish because if they leave their their cubs, they're they're in danger. And so – um, that's a little sad to see because, you know, the, the mom knows she has to go get a fish to feed herself and, and, and the cubs, but just can't leave them. So that's, it's a real trick mm-hmm. for the mama bears to try to get enough food. To, mm-hmm. And for that reason, the, the rangers told us, and we saw it firsthand, that the, most of the mama bears and their cubs were hanging out around the camp and around Neck, Neck Lake, where we landed, um, for safety reasons. I think they they just felt safer there. Right. Every now and then, they would be at a part of the river that's away from the falls that they could you know, try to fish for like a few seconds right. without any mm-hmm. any danger around. And and sometimes I think they there are fish wash up on the shore that that have have died. And so so anyway, there there's there are other opportunities for them to get food, but it's it's pretty sparse. So we finally got our turn at the falls platform, and we uh, squeezed our way in with all of the professional photographers. You should have seen the equipment that they had, the tripods and the the huge expensive cameras. It was it was something to see. I think we were the only people with a little point and shoot camera. Yeah, there were a few few tourists like us that had. You know, just little digital cameras. And this was back before cameras on, on a smartphone were, were good enough to take pictures. We had a, a small little digital camera. We still still got a, a lot of great photos. But uh, it, it was interesting to see once you're on that falls platform, you know, people would – they would stay there until the ranger came and, and called them off, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, the good thing about that platform, the way they have it set up, it's two-tiered and – uh, everyone had a spot on the on the railing, so you had no one between you and the falls. So you had a perfect shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not like you know you were in the second row or third row, and people were in front of you. Uh, it's it was, it's actually set up pretty well, but uh, the time goes by pretty quick, and the ranger would come with their clipboard and you know call out a name and. We went back on that platform multiple times. Oh, yeah. You just – once your time's up, you put your name back on right. the list. And it wasn't that long. No, it wasn't that Plus, long. Plus, there's not a whole lot else to do there. So, mm-hmm. Right, right. So when we were there the first time, there were probably – right at that falls, there were probably about 10 bears. Is that what you'd say? At the falls? Well, mm-hmm. I have a photo where I, I can count nine. Okay. And I know there were others Mm-hmm. Like a, a, outside the view viewfinder, right. right? So the star of the show was the this alpha male bear. It, it was clear he was huge, and he had the primo fishing spot, and he was catching salmon right and left as we watched. Yeah, he he would catch 
one, um, I think I was, um, I think I counted, I th- think he was catching about seven or eight an hour. Mm-hmm. So maybe five to 10 minutes between fish. And of course, there's times where they catch one. He would catch one and then he would go off maybe 20 yards away to this little island and eat it. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't fishing the, the whole time. Right. And of course, while he moved away from his spot to eat the salmon, a couple of other bears would kind of sniff around and kind of act like they were going to go over to his fishing spot and he would look over and they would see him look over and they would they would move off. They would be and, afraid. Yeah. This bear had scars all over his face and his shoulder was bleeding. It looked like oh, he'd yeah. done battle with a lot of them. Well, In fact, and, I, I yeah. named him Scarface, remember? Yeah, I don't know. Right. You named him Scarface because he had all these scars. I don't know if that was his official name. All of these bears, all of them. Are in a database. I know, and the, they they do have names. The Rangers, they they've named every one of them. They know how old they are, mm-hmm. um, who their relatives are. So uh, it's it's pretty well documented. Mm-hmm. Um, we heard at least a couple of times pretty fierce battles off in the trees. Oh yeah, and uh, one time we heard it, and it was it was sounded like. They were killing each other, and one of the bears came out of the trees, and he was bleeding pretty profusely around the shoulder. So mm-hmm. anyway, th- this is – there's a real competition for those best fishing spots. Oh, definitely. And the thing about the spot that Scarface had claimed, it was this deep pool of water right there where the salmon – were congregating before they made the leap up the falls. And so it was interesting to watch him. He would literally go underwater. He would disappear. And then his he would come up and he had a fish in his mouth. So he, he was basically, yeah, he was fishing under the water instead of catching them as they. Well, he could feel them go between his legs because mm-hmm. they had, that's where they had to kind of get some momentum to hop up the falls. And so. Oftentimes, you'll see these photographs of the bears at the top of the falls, and they're trying to catch them mm-hmm. in the air. And and I would say that that's the number two spot uh, that looks like the number one fishing spot. But that's number two. The the number one where the alpha bear was was down at the bottom, and yeah, he would. You could tell he was. You would his head would twitch, and he would go underwater real yeah. quick, and he would come up and, and with with the salmon. Mm-hmm. And as, so as we're watching this show, it was, it was the whole thing was just fascinating. But the thing that I loved so much was on this little island that Matt had mentioned was this old, old bear. And the, the ranger told us that he was 30 years old. His, his fur looked like he was wearing a, like his big brother's, you know, suit coat or something. It looks like this fur was bigger than his body. Mm -hmm. But you could tell that at one time he was big enough Mm -hmm. uh, to have all that fur. And the other bears were still pretty afraid of him. And and I'm sure that they could remember battles with him Mm -hmm. in the past. And you just never know if he still has enough in him to to fight for the 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 best fishing spot but anyway he he was moving pretty slow and he was breathing heavily and he was hanging out on that island he was and what i loved was that this alpha male bear would when he caught a salmon he would take it over to the island he would sort of rip it open eat most of it and then he would leave the remains for this old bear and the old bear would go out and eat it and and uh, and this happened over and over again yeah we he did it several there. times it wasn't mm-hmm. an accident it, no he and, was definitely feeding this right and it bear. wasn't that uh, there were so many fish that you know the bear was the alpha bear was eating just the best part of the fish, and since there was so much, he was you know throwing the rest away. This was he was clearly feeding the old man bear. Clearly, so the ranger told us that uh, as we were talking about what was going on before our eyes, she was telling us that they never interfere with nature, and that no matter what happens, whether a cub is being attacked or or they're watching this old bear, you know, sort of starve. They they don't interfere in any way. They have to let nature run its course. 
which is probably pretty tough to do at times mm-hmm. with with all that bear activity there, particularly with, with the cubs. But that's what they have to do. Well, we had had, I don't know, several visits on the platform, and, it, and the mosquitoes were yeah. kind of getting us. So we decided to go back and – um, it may have been late afternoon or, or dinner time. So we went back to the lodge area that mm-hmm. uh, the fireplace. Yeah, the and round fireplace. Sit around the fireplace mm-hmm. and visit with the other other people who are in camp. And I, that little area, you can buy beer there. And so we just kind of sat in the chairs around the fireplace. And we had maybe a beer or two. And that, that building where – the, the lodges and you can eat doesn't have a bathroom. So after a couple of beers, I'm looking for the restroom and find out that you have to go outside to the bathhouse. And there's a little bathhouse where the campers can take a shower and, and uh, there's restrooms in there. So I walk out of the lodge and I take maybe 10 steps away from the building and I could see the bathhouse. It's it's maybe 20 yards away. I'm walking towards it. And out from the bushes walks this huge bear and just walks like right in front of me. And it's, he was maybe 20 feet, 30 feet in front of me. And, of course, I stopped. I backed up a little. I had the wits about me to get my camera out and take a picture. Of course, I wasn't going to run away from him. Right. And he was he was just crossing the path. He was not interested in me. He wasn't coming at me. He was actually moving away from me a little bit. But I got a couple of pictures. And then, of course, uh, I go to the bathroom and I come back. And I remember telling people in the lodge that I had, you know, I just got went to the restroom and on the way – uh, a bear walked in front of me and like no one was surprised. <laughs> I know. We were like, like oh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. There's there's bears. There's bears yeah, everywhere. It, it, it had already become and we'd only been there for what, five hours maybe. It had already sort of become like ordinary. Oh, yeah. There, there are bears everywhere. They're everywhere. So after we had dinner that day, uh, by the way, I don't know if we mentioned this. We were only staying one night at Katmai. So after we had dinner, we decided to walk down to the campground and see what that was like. And there, there's a trail through the woods that that takes you there. So we walked down and checked it out. And as we're walking back on this trail and we're getting close to where the visitor center is, we can see ahead of us there are a couple of rangers there. And it appears as though they're yelling to us or they're yelling to somebody. Well, for a while, they were just looking at us intently. <laughs> and then the one ranger, who's a law enforcement ranger, he puts his hand on – he rests his hand on his gun. I know. And and they were intently l- looking at us and, and I had no idea like what. And then all of a sudden, they start – they start waving their arms and yelling, get off the trail, get off the trail. And we had no idea what they were talking about. And, of course, what was happening this whole time is behind us. And, of course, we're not looking behind us. Right. We, we don't see this happening. There's a mother bear and her cubs following her walking towards us. Well, they're following us on the trail. They're walking right. behind they're, us on the same trail right, right and, behind and, us. And they're they're catching us. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so we got off into the trees. We practiced our di- get behind a, a tree. A, at a diagonal. <laughs> and uh, I don't think we could speak. So I did, they may not have known that we were human. No, but uh, that was crazy. They literally walked. And, of course, this was not 50 yards and not our fault. I mean, I, I don't know. They were maybe – 10 yards away yeah, they, as they, they were they were close they were close and the mama and but you know she didn't glance our way and of course we were paralyzed with fear but it was pretty amazing to see them walk by that close so yeah so after that little experience we decided to again go back to brooks falls and uh, check that out you know july in alaska it stays light until gosh Forever. Well, pretty much yeah. all night long. I mean, it, it gets a little dusky at around one in the morning, but there's so much uh, so much daylight. 
Yeah, and I don't yeah. know if you said this, but the day trippers usually are gone. Right. So there's mm -hmm. – the, I don't even think there was a waiting list no, for the uh, – there wasn't. For the main platform. Uh, hardly any – there were hardly any humans on the platform, but there were a lot more bears in the river. There were a lot of mosquitoes, though. Yeah. When we prepared for the trip, we had gotten a, a couple of different things to – keep the mosquitoes away, eucalyptus oil and this other bug spray that had 30% DEET. We were very quickly, we went to the 100% DEET. <laughs> and um, that was really the only way to make those mosquitoes bearable. Mm -hmm. And we did have uh, head nets too. Right. And we wore those um, the whole time. So, yeah, it, that's that's the one downside is July is, is pretty – Horrible for mosquitoes. Buggy, yeah. Pretty buggy. So the next day, we had pretty much the whole day. We weren't scheduled to fly out of there until about 5 p.m. And we had thought about they have a tour that goes to the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. And we had thought about doing it, but we were just – we were worried that we wouldn't get back in time and we might miss our flight because that is an all-day tour. Yeah, we didn't do that. Uh, we did go back to the – viewing platform did that a couple of rounds on the viewing platform and um then came back came back to the lodge area mm -hmm. uh decided that we were just going to spend the last couple hours in the lodge area and uh we were there kind of at the edge of camp by the trading post and we were talking to a ranger and there were a few other people around maybe seven or eight of us in total uh, visiting with this ranger right in the middle of the trail. And I forget what we were talking about, but she, she was listening to her radio because her radio is always on. And she says, well, she goes, I'm sorry, folks, I, I, I got to uh, listen to this. And uh, she said, I, I, I need all of you people to back up. And uh, she pointed to this little hill that was like right next to the trail. She goes, I need you to all get up on that, it's about maybe 20 feet off the trail, and just all stand there in a group and, until uh, I tell you it's safe. And so what she was doing was she had heard on her radio that a mother bear and her cubs were approaching the lodge. Mm -hmm. They weren't coming down the trail. They knew that she was coming through like the marshy grass area, and they weren't totally sure – where she was, but they kind of knew she was heading towards the lodge. And so the ranger stood in the middle of the trail, kept walk, watching uh, in, in, towards the area of the river. And sure enough, a few minutes later, this big mama bear comes out of the tall grass and three little cubs following mm -hmm. her. And this, we, we knew instantly that this was a different mama bear than the one that had followed us followed us the night before because the third little cub that popped out of the brush was a runt. It was the cutest thing I have ever seen looked in like my a monkey. life. It looked like a little monkey. It was tiny. Yeah. And I mean, oh my gosh. And he was um, mischievous. He was. He was, he was, he was far was, behind Yeah, them. he was far behind. He was uh, like eating grass. He was, he was looking around. I think he, every now and then he would run and jump on one of the other uh -huh. cubs. Yeah, the other two cubs were like right behind Mama, mm -hmm. like right in a row, weren't going too far. This this little guy, he was he was like playing with rocks and uh -huh. stuff. And so – yeah, and you wanted to you wanted to grab him and I take him to home. Take him home with us. And the interesting thing too for us to watch was the ranger who's standing in front of our little group of people. As they're walking by, she literally holds out her left arm, and she's pointing, and she is saying to the bear, "Nothing to see here. Keep on moving." And you know, I don't know if the bear heard or if the bear was listening, but the, the bear didn't even glance in our direction and literally did keep on going in the direction he was go she was going. That was a big event for, for the uh, little lodge area because there were quite a few people like hanging around. I think the, the planes were starting to leave in the afternoon to mm -hmm. take people back to wherever. And I think there was a uh, television camera crew that had been at the park doing some filming and they were like waiting 
And they all ran and grabbed their equipment and as quick as they could set up to start getting some uh, footage of her because she kind of came through. She didn't just pass through. She kind of wandered through camp. And so uh, the Rangers actually had a little bit of a hard time like keeping the paparazzi back away from her as, to let her have her space and, and get through camp. Uh, so that was, that was very exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, after that passed, we had a little bit more time. We did the, – the, the, the thing about the plane out was – we never knew when exactly it was going to come and get us. But basically, the the guy coordinating the flight times was saying, you know, when when it's your turn to fly out, you need to be here and be ready because mm-hmm. they come and go. And they're shuttling people back. Yeah, and forth, but but he couldn't really case. tell us exactly mm-hmm. when that was. And so there was like maybe an hour or two there where basically you you need to be right around here mm-hmm. just in case your plane is ready. And so uh, we were walking around the lodge area, and at one point in time we were standing on the beach of Knack Lake mm-hmm. where the planes come and park, just standing there watching, and, and it was a beautiful day. Uh, and we could see off in the distance, maybe, I don't know, a quarter mile away, there's, there was a bear coming down the beach, mm-hmm. and you could see for a long distance along oh, yeah. along this lake, mm-hmm. and so he's he's coming towards us, and and he's far enough away that, that we could stand there and watch him for like 10, 15 minutes. But at some point, he gets to let's say a hundred yards away, and we know that like eventually we're going to have to move because he's still coming, he's walking slow, he's not within fifty yards, so we don't have to leave right away. And there was another man and his teenage son uh, standing there with us, taking photographs. And as the bear got closer, I think the teenage son, he's he was out of there. He's like, I got we're, we got to go. And the father kept taking photographs and you and I were there. And when the bear got to about 50 yards, we turned to leave. And I said to the, the, the other gentleman, I said, you know, we're supposed to back up when the bear gets within 50 yards. And he said, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, but he kept taking pictures, and so the bear kept coming. And I was watching the bear, but I had this guy, this other gentleman in the corner of my eye, and I said, you know, we really need to leave now. And so the gentleman said, yeah, we should. He turns to walk back towards the visitor center, and as he turns, all of his uh, lenses fall out of his camera bag into the sand. And so – like I'm now about 10 feet further towards the visitor center than this guy. And I see this happen and I'm looking at the bear. And the when this happens, the bear looks up and looks at, at, at us. And the guy bends down to get his lenses. And I said, you need to just leave those. We'll come back and get them later. The bear's looking at us. And the guy just kept putting his stuff in his bag. And I bent down to grab the guy to just basically like grab him by the coat to like, let's go. And as soon as I did that, the bear starts running straight at us. I'll never forget that. In fact, we have a picture. I, the, the last picture you snapped, he lifts his head up and he it's like he's starting to make that yeah. run. <laughs> and so the bear like – went like two or three strides towards us and we all took off running. Oh like, my gosh. I, I'm just the, like I said, if a bear runs at you, you will run. The like, never run from a bear went completely out of no, our heads. No, we just took off and ran like hell. I thought after about ten steps, I thought this this isn't really happening. Uh you know, maybe the bear isn't chasing us. And I look back and the bear is catching us. I mean he's he is he's getting closer and I thought the whole time I'm thinking, shit, like this is it. This is how it ends. The bear is going to like grab one of us. And so we kept running. We were not that far from the visitor center. Right, which is one of the reasons we were running to yeah, the to, visitor to, we were, center. I, I was thinking we need either get to the visitor center or the – I thought maybe we had enough time to get on the other side of the electric mm-hmm. fence. But we kept running and – 
as soon as we kind of turned off towards the visitor the break in the trees mm-hmm. where the visitor center is, uh, there was a crowd of people watching. Oh all, yeah, and all they of this. all drove into the visitor uh, center. Oh yeah, they were just like piling <laughs> in the visitor. They could see that bear coming. <laughs> uh, and as we got to, I don't know, 10, 20 feet from the steps of the visitor center, uh, some of the people started yelling that the the bear had had veered off. So he essentially he chased us off. He did. That's he. He was. I still think he was sort of playing with us. He wanted yeah. to give us a good scare. Well, he did. I know. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. If he wanted to catch us, he would have. Sure. So that was stupid on, on on a lot of parts, but you know the the point is, and and when he started chasing us, he was probably fifty yards away. This this wasn't like we let him get within you know. 30 feet or something like that. I mean, it's that whole 50-yard thing, that's that's important. Well, yeah, but they can move so fast. Right. They can cover yeah. that ground in a second. Right. I yeah. mean, yeah. So uh, that was our experience. I, th- yeah. I thought it was all over. I was going to I was gonna try to hop the electric fence, but... I would have liked to you, have seen like, that. I wasn't worried about you because you were... <laughs> I, I think you were in the visitor center by the time I came through the trees. I would have stayed and, and protected you yeah. if I would have had bear spray. But let's face it, you, yeah. everyone, it's every man for himself yeah. at that point. And mm-hmm. I think, yeah, you won that one. I did. You won that, that race yeah. by a long shot. Yeah. So uh, anyway, it was an incredible experience. It was, you know, besides these uh, bear stories that we've told you, every time that we walked to the falls platform and we were walking through the woods, there would be bears everywhere. So we we saw bears the entire time we were there. We counted, we probably saw, well, over 100 bears, but it was like being inside a zoo. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Being on the, like, the bear side of the zoo. Right, right. right. And uh, yeah, I just, I can't imagine another experience that would top that one. Right. I kept thinking that someday we'll look back and say, remember when they used to let you walk around with the bears, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that's, so of all of our park experiences, that is right up there, if not the number one. Definitely. Definitely. We talked about a lot of information today. So if you would like more specific information, it's all available on the Katmai National Park website. The um, All the lodging information for Brooks Camp is available on a website called katmyland.com. All the information for camping at Brooks Camp is available on recreation.gov. And one more thing, in the summer... There are bear cams posted along Brooks River where you can get on your computer and you can watch the bears fishing and doing all kinds of things. And it's almost like you're there. Yeah. Great experience. Got to do that again sometime. I'd love to go back. It's time for Mailbag. Yes, it is. Karen surprised me with the question of the day. Okay, Matt, I will do that. This question comes from Mike in Minneapolis, and his question is, in hindsight, what lessons did you learn from your journey to all the national parks? If you were to do it all again, what would you do differently? Mm. Oh, Mike. (laughs) Okay, we would do every everything differently. <laughs> oh yeah, how long do we have? Yeah, I first of all, maybe at a higher level, I'm not sure I would just make the declaration that we're going to go to all the national park national parks. Right. Uh, while it was great to do that, and it was fun to see them all, and we probably went to parks that we wouldn't have otherwise. You know that it it seemed like. At times, we were just going to parks just because it w- they were on the list. Exactly. And we found out later, years later, as we started exploring public lands of all kinds, how many incredible national monuments there are and all kinds of other NPS sites and other public lands. And so I think one thing we would have done differently is – as we mapped out our visits to the national parks, we would have looked at what else was close by in the national park system and visited those places as well. I wouldn't have tried to do it in a year. 
No. Like, like we, our, our idea was quit our jobs, travel for a year, go to all the parks, and then figure out what we're going to do next, which would probably meant go, go back to work. And that is just not enough time to do it right. As it turned out, it took two years mm-hmm. to do it that way. And that was still too quick. So uh, assigning an arbitrary time limit on it, I don't think was a good thing. We we could have said, you know, over the next 10 years or over the next five to 15 years, it's a aspiration of ours to go to all the national parks. And I think we would have then gone slower and mm-hmm. done uh, probably more things in each park. Exactly. Right. We, we missed a lot of great stuff the first time around. We know that because we we were on a time limit for sure. And nothing made me matter than we would talk to somebody about a particular park after our trip and they would say, oh, and did you see this, you know, this amazing waterfall? Did you do that hike? And we were like, no, we didn't. You know, it's a, so we, we know we missed a lot of great stuff. And we've spent years going back to these places and making up for it. You're not going to be able in some parks you're not going to be able to fulfill all your wish list in one visit. Right. I mean, you can't, obviously, you can't snowmobile in Yellowstone and do a hike in the mountains Mm -hmm. in in the same visit. Like, you you have to do that different times of the year. So um, that's another thing is for some parks, I guess there, there, there might be a, absolute perfect time to go mm-hmm. like Katmai like we talked about but uh, in other uh, with with a lot of other parks it's every season's a great time and there's just different things that you would do in that park so uh, really to see most parks and appreciate them it's multiple visits definitely and I think a few other things I wish that we would have camped in the in the parks if you've uh, read our book, Dear Bob and Sue, you know that we did not camp. We were not campers. We didn't have the equipment. And now that we are campers and we see what we missed, I really regret that. Yeah, there would have been some really good experiences we would have had if, if we camped. But but we didn't. It's, it's not like we like wasted those trips. But now we're going back and mm-hmm. we're camping mm-hmm. at some of those parks. And so we're seeing different things because we're camping. Right. And another thing that we learned is that the evening hours in the parks are some of the absolute best times of day to visit. So we used to spend the entire day hiking. We'd be worn out. We'd go back to our hotel, have a beer, have dinner, and call it a night. And I think we we did miss a lot of we missed a lot of beautiful sunsets. We missed uh, seeing the park with, when there are fewer crowds. The wildlife comes out more at night. So now we go always go back into the park after dinner, always. And it's some of the absolute best times we've had. Dawn and dusk mm-hmm. are the good times. It's not only good because of the angle of the sun for photographs, but it's also, like you said, the uh, wildlife comes out. It's easier at dusk because you're already up and it's it's the middle of the day, so to speak. But uh, some of the greatest wildlife we've seen is early in the morning. I remember one one morning we were getting ready to do a hike and and we were going to try to get on the trail at, at like 5.30 in the morning. And I went out to the car uh, at 5 a.m. And I saw this small herd of elk and they were beautiful and huge. And right there it was just me and them. And they're they're not out in the day because people come out and kind of mm-hmm. sc- scare them off. And so, at at dawn, oftentimes you see a lot of great wildlife. Yeah, that's some of the most magical times in the park. So, what else? What else would you do different? The other thing I feel like we could have done better. I know we could have done better. Is we um, could have researched things a little bit better. Um, we've we learned our lessons, and now we research the heck out of everything. You know, for instance, early on when we went to Cuyahoga Valley National Park, one of the things I really, really wanted to do was ride the train through the park. And we were there on a Monday and Tuesday in the summer, and the trains don't run on Monday and Tuesday. So that was a big disappointment. Um, So I, I would advise anyone going to the parks to do all the research you can about the park, the weather, the time of year, the places to go, the hikes to do, things around the park. Uh, just, you know, make sure that you have 
done extensive research. And call, if there is something based on your research that you really want to do, call the ranger station sure. uh, a week before or a couple days before, depending on what, what that thing is, because uh, that trail might be closed or there might be something else that the ranger will tell you or there might be a tip. So, you know, these are natural places that, that are affected by, you know, wind and weather and floods and trees down and things like that. And so just a quick call to the visitor center to talk to a ranger could help also. Mm -hmm, definitely. If you have a question for us, you can send us an email to mattandkarensmith at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media. Go to facebook.com slash dearbobands. Or you can find us on Instagram at Matt and Karen Smith. We'll review all the questions that come in, and we'll be answering some of them in our mailbag segment on future episodes. To see pictures from Katmai National Park, go to www.thedearbobandsuepodcast.com and click on the title for the episode eight. There you'll find the show notes for this episode and links to other information. Matt and I love reading your reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thank you all so much for the sweet comments. If you haven't yet subscribed, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, as well as Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. The books that this podcast is based on are available on Amazon.com. Just search for Dear Bob and Sue. And you can also find more information about us by heading over to www.dearbobandsue.com. Our show is produced by the amazing team at Puddle Creative in Portland, Oregon. Our artwork is by the designers at Expert Subjects, and our theme music is by Will West. Here's hoping all your bear encounters are from a safe distance. And if they're not, here's hoping that your bear spray isn't expired. <laughs>